Let them praise us, give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah, all ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his, and his glory is exalted. And his glory, and his glory is exalted. And his glory, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Are y'all all still here? We're all here. <laughs> well, happy Father's Day to the fathers among you. Felton, don't give us any roses. I wouldn't know what to do with one. Besides, uh, Judy said something to me this morning about Happy Father's Day. I said, well, thank you very much, but I don't need a day to know I'm a father. I still got the scars. And the blessings. And the blessings. More blessings than anything. Absolutely. You couldn't couldn't count it a, a successful life if you didn't didn't look back at your children. Think how blessed we are to have had sweet, loving Christian fathers. Because everybody has not had that experience. <laughs> that is true. Uh Let's, uh, we, we, since uh, we dealt with wives and husbands and fathers and children up to this point, and then let's just back up and see what kind of questions and comments y'all have to make uh, about what we've been studying, because you were remarkably quiet during all of that time. I know you had some reactions. You don't talk about topics that are that emotionally laden and not somebody have a reaction. In the society today, the feminist movement has rocked a lot of boats. And one of the things I've been watching with interest is the Southern Baptist Convention has had Churches installing pulpit ministers as women of pulpit ministers. And uh, it was interesting the way they did that is just left that up to the individual church, which I think is a great way to do that. But uh, the feminist movement has changed our society. Shelby, our granddaughter, went to medical school, and half the school, half the the uh, uh, the med students are women, which is fine. You know that doesn't create uh, tension, but there are certain areas. I mean, we have women uh, umpires in the national. Well, 
how would you describe the situation that we're in as Christians? There are there are roles, there are relationships, there are conditions that were laid down in creation. And we've misunderstood them for a lot of years. And understood them and misunderstood them. And now, to be honest, we live in a society where the family has been under attack since early 1900. Most people weren't aware of it because it always starts at the academy or university level and it tends to trickle down. Uh, well, is it? It's really not a uh, not related to an economic or political system. It's more of a, come on, Mickey, come on up and join us. Grab a, grab a lesson sheet. If there's not any back there, will somebody share with her? But uh, there's a lot that we have to get over. Uh, I know one of the things that I've studied two or three times rather seriously in my life was the role of women in, in uh, all of society and church and whatnot because I have two, my children are both daughters, two very strong, intelligent, highly accomplished women. Uh, People have all have always thought that I would should be some kind of a well, I don't know what a charging liberal or whatever. And I guess I, in some ways I've seen things that we've done in our fellowship in the past that was just because of we we were told that by somebody else. We were told that by somebody else. We were told that by somebody else. And it just came from out of really nowhere. What? Tradition. Well, it was tradition. But before it was a tradition, it was a prejudice. And then that became, that got wrapped into a tradition which doesn't have all of the negative connotations. And very seldom have we ever gone back and and tried to establish what the truth is from the very beginning. And that's true of the role of the male and female in, in the church. That's true of the role of husband and wife and children and fathers. We need to realize that what we were taught by old brother so-and-so who may have had a third grade education may not be uh, all that there is to know. And we need to get back and find out what God said because what God said is exactly what counts. And there's no deviation from it. No, no, he sure didn't. I think he made women smart and intelligent. Look at Sarah and all that she had to do to have her compound move when Abraham wanted to move. Look at all the other women in the Bible that were smart and intelligent women. Were, were they supposed to just stand back out of the way and do nothing? No. I mean, go back to the beginning. Look at Adam and Eve. Were they working together? Yes, they had to. That's why I Well, before that, when they were in the garden, when things were working the way they were supposed to, what were they doing? They were working together. We could, we got the summary phrase, tending the garden, or whatever, but it was a whole lot more than that. It was being God's representative on this earth. It's like 
I was trying to say last couple of weeks ago, God did establish some, some relationships there and some roles. He created Adam first, right out of the dirt. So guys, don't get too arrogant. You're, you're nothing but dirt when it comes down to it. But then he created Eve, and he took Eve from Adam. So, he gave Adam certain prerequisites, like naming Eve. And, but when they were presented to each other, what was it like? Was it just strangers? Was it just mates? I imagine Adam said, wow. <laughs> well, if you can look at what he said, it's pretty much he's beside himself. Because there's the other half. There's the rest of him. And before that, he wasn't complete. It wasn't good. By God's own judgment. But after the f- that, each had their own function. Each had their own roles. Eve could do things Adam couldn't do. Women today can do things men cannot do. And no matter how much we try to bend the rules of biology, they keep reasserting themselves. There are certain things that don't change. Uh, I have an acquaintance whose daughter graduated from medical school about four years ago. Uh, Yeah, about that time. Uh, And, of course, once you get out of medical school, you you just... Now you have a license to go learn how to be a doctor. So, landing your residency and getting a good match on the residency is... Very, very important. And that's why they have them match day and all of that where students are matched up with their residencies and they try to get the best residency in the country they can. Well, one of the ones that she was interested in, said she was training to be a pediatrician, was in Oregon. So she goes up to Seattle to visit they do this. They, the top two or three, they go around and visit. And what she encountered was a situation when a baby was born. Uh, the head of the department insisted that they not present the baby to the mother and say, here's your boy or here's your girl, but only here's your baby. Whether there be a boy or a girl will be determined by how they live. She didn't choose to go there. (laughs) She chose to go to Kansas City to one of the main hospitals there. And since she was one of the top students in the class at A&M Medical School, she got to pick. So, but what started out as wild-eyed, radical ideas being presented by some professors in 1900, 1890 to 1910, in that time frame. By 1990, I mean 2020, let's say, has become the basis of a, a procedure that affects everybody that comes through there. Now, it doesn't change what kind of uh, genetics are behind each of the babies that are born. But some people want to act like it does. 
there are there are things to be learned from creation that are immutable, no matter what our ideas are. And there are things that we have been told that creation teaches that are, in fact, not there and need to be set aside as we discover what we are supposed to live like today. Because how we're supposed to live today is very, very much like the way we were supposed to live way back whenever, and certainly back to 60 A.D. Some of the things won't. How do we resolve the cultural differences interpreting what the New Testament says? And some people believe now that is a new system. Very much so. And as we get to looking at things like the roles of husbands and wives, the roles of children and what children can do and can't do, what children owe to their parents and don't owe to their parents, uh, it becomes very important that we be very clear about why we are practicing what we practice. Because just because we learned it when we were young may not mean what it is today. I don't think my mother or father, either one, ever thought about having to deal with some of the moral ethical questions that Christians have to deal with today. But, you know what? They had to deal with some that were settled by the same principles. So it's a matter of getting back to what are the basic principles that God taught and how do they apply to where we find ourselves living today. And boy, where we live in America is one thing. Where somebody who is a Christian who's living in England today, it's a totally different story. And if they happen to be in Asia, in Malaysia or Taiwan or India, it's a very different story. And it has to, and we have to be Christians, no matter where we are, or no matter what the calendar says. So let's back up, and let's see what you're, you've got on your mind. What did you get that you can apply today? Not so much, I mean, the relationship between you and your spouse, pretty well set in stone. I mean, whatever mistakes or blessings you have done to each other, uh, they're there. You're not going to change what happened back 20 years ago or whatever. But what about your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids? You know, my great-grandkids are growing up in an environment that is so different from what I grew up in, it's hard to recognize what they're supposed to do. I dreamed as a 
11, 12, 13, 14 year old kid, I dreamed that someday I'd see the Indianapolis 500. My great granddaughter, who just visited us this week, flew to Indianapolis and, had a, and watched the Indianapolis 500 throughout their entire race. Because her boyfriend's father is a race enthusiast, and for a time, her boyfriend, who what former boyfriend, she is, they both moved on, but they're still friends, uh, was training to be a professional race driver. He's since decided he'd rather be an engineer and go to college. <laughs> but uh, uh, things like that, that's just a one example of what's changed. It's not the important part. The important part is the attitudes that exist. The way it affects our relationships as we get along with each other, as we advise our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of how do you choose a profession? How do you choose a mate? How do you treat your kids as they're growing up under you? What are your reactions? What, are you, what do you want to do? Don't do like most people in the church do, which is simply say, I don't have anything to say about that. I don't know anything about it. I'm just hands off. I expect early children, I think, in our home, from the very beginning, I mean, we don't really, when we talk about finding a mate, we don't talk about dating. That's one thing, trying it on for size and dating all these people. We talk about getting to know the person first before you do that. And um, we talk about higher education at an early age. We start everything at an early age. It's appropriate, right? And certain things that I would tell Ethan would be different on a subject that I tell Isaac. It'd be limited information, but as they get older, we continue to discuss these things. And I think it's important, you know, people think, you know, we all know that we homeschool, that you shelter your kids. I don't shelter my kids. I try to give them appropriate information. I don't give them the whole thing, but I say, this is what you're going to encounter in your life, you know? And um, we're here, we love you, and we want to be able to help you along that journey to have that good relationship with them. When they have those issues, they can come back. What's a word that Paul used about living a Christian life that might help inform us about what's going on? When he talks about how you how we live, he always uses a particular uh, verb that isn't live. What does he say? What? Run the race or walk. Because the Christian life is what? It's a journey. We're moving from where we are born to wherever it's going to end up. And along the way, what's important is how we walk, how we make that journey. And there are a lot of things, there are a lot of distractions that come along that try to uh, deceive us or influence us to deviate one way or the other and step off the path that we're supposed to follow. Because do you think that it's always easy to figure out what you're supposed to do? What did Jesus, how did Jesus describe it to help give us an idea of what it would be like? Bob, that's kind of your, one of your favorite scriptures in the, in the passage of your favorite scriptures. Long toward the end. I'm talking about the Sermon on the Mount.
But when he talks about this path we're walking on, there, there are always two, at least two paths to choose. And one of them's what? It's narrow. It's difficult. It's not easy. But you see, pleasing God in a world that's run amok is not easy. Now, it's easy to do what? Just go along. What? The path of least resistance leads you where? (laughs) Ultimately, it does. But you've got to convince four and five year olds, and two year olds, and three year olds before they. That how they make decisions at that point will determine how they make decisions when they're 30 and 35. And the, it is a, a parent to choose the difficult path. people would play football, not because you get famous, not because you get rich, not because you get accolades and so forth, but because it's hard. He said, doing that is hard, and it, it, it develops a man, and then he went on to expound kind of what lessons he learned. That's that is certainly one of the great issues. It's more difficult for parents today, I believe, to find something meaningful for kids to be involved in that involves work than it than it was. For our parents, Bill. I would say this: uh, our preacher is a good and their family is a good example of teaching their kids to work. I mean, Chick Fil A has educated the whole Brazil family. I mean, I, I mean, and taught them how to work. Okay. Now, since this is Father.
siblings can be raised by the same parents and it turn out totally different. And it goes back to Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. We got all kind of examples through the I mean Esau sold his birthright and uh, the brothers put their brother into uh, slavery in uh, Joseph. You know? And then I look at it, my sister and I were raised by the same parents. But Yes. Some of it does, for sure. Yes, some of it is just free will. There's free will. Sam? My dad was very, you know, affectionate towards me. Never thanked me or anything, you know, good or bad. But everybody thinks he's so sweet and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and docile, you know. When I was growing up, I didn't. If I so much as, you know, looked the wrong way during church, he would yank me up and march me down the aisle to the bathroom and wear my butt out and then bring me back. Lots of times. <laughs> Shouldn't have been so big headed stubborn. <laughs> oh. May I, may I tell you a little story about that? One, one last story, then we've got to move on.
Well, to summarize this, it, we all had upbringings, and they were all different. When I was a preacher and had the temptation to try to look at counseling, I could have built an entire practice out of the children of parents who did not raise their children in the nature, nurture, and admonition of the Lord. I, did, I knew I didn't have the personality to be a counselor, so I didn't go that way. You hit a point a while ago. If parents, if fathers, provoke their children to wrath, if they beat their kids into submission, and that really bother fathers or mothers and do not love them. It makes it very, very difficult for them, that person, to ever have a relationship with God. Uh, I don't know how many women, 35, 40 years old, would come into the office angry over the abuse they had suffered as children, and so angry that the place they took it out was on the church. And they were looking for somebody to help them express their anger rather than somebody to help them get over it. If you ever, if you find yourself in that situation, you've got to to deal with that anger. And the only way to do it is to deal with it the way God dealt with His wrath toward you as a sinner. And that is to forgive the person who was sinning and move on. So that makes a problem for adult children who now have aging or ill parents who may have been abusive when the children were children. And I'm not talking about wearing your butt out, Sam. That's not abuse. I'm talking about everything from sexual abuse to depriving of food and clothing, you name it, that you eventually run into if you're around dealing with the public long enough. And uh, it's very difficult to bring somebody through that. Please find a way. If you're in that situation, please find somebody who can help you get over it. I don't care if you're 100 years old. If you're still harboring resentment from what happened to you as a child, it will interfere with your relationship with God. You have to get past it. And there's people who are very good at dealing with that. I'm not one of them. Well, so much of society now is built around this victim mentality. Yes. And that's not really helpful. I am a victim, therefore I'm excused from what's my responsibility. That's not really true. And as we move into Paul's next session, and let me see if I can figure out where this is. Chapter 6, verse 5. We have a lot of people today are really dealing with anger and resentment over what happened to their grandparents or great-grandparents because this country had a history of practicing slavery. One of the worst parts of our history. And one of the things that comes up to this 
to us to have to deal with is people who attempt to blame slavery or blame God for slavery. God had nothing to do with slavery being coming into existence. There were no slaves in the garden. Think about that. But there was no divorce either. Where did divorce come from? Bob, if you get to where you talk, close. From the hardness of humans' heart. Well, where did slavery come from? Exactly the same place. Now, in Roman culture, we've only got about four minutes left, so we'll have to deal with some of this next week. Next week, please read chapter 6, verse uh, 10 through the end of the chapter, because I will be dealing with that. How do you continue to... To what, what is your challenge for the rest of your life? But <clears throat> God didn't, wasn't responsible for slavery coming into existence. In the Roman culture, slavery was a very broad category. The majority of Roman slaves could look forward to someday being free. Because they were economic slaves. They became slaves through debt or some other means and could either buy themselves out of slavery or be bought out of slavery, be redeemed out of slavery by someone else. That does not say anything about the political slaves who were those who were captured because of the conquest of Rome, who were sentenced to slavery by a court of Roman law. And frankly, the only way they could be free was to die. And the church contained everyone from the political slaves to the masters who were members of the patrician class. Read the book of Philemon. Because there you're dealing with the problem that came up because of that widespread of what the members were like. And in the church in Roman Asia, where Paul is writing in 60 A.D., and though Paul is not not condoning anything, he's trying to tell Christians how they can survive as Christians in a situation they didn't create. And they, in a situation they, could not. they couldn't change. There was no feasible way for it to change. Now, Christianity would change slavery. But it took it almost 2,000 years. Not quite. About 1,500 years. But when you have a religion that says... Love your neighbor as yourself. And everyone is your neighbor. Then what's going to happen to slavery? It's going to eventually be done away with. And it was Christianity that was the biggest reason slavery was made illegal to the extent it is. Now, one other thing before I I let you go. Don't think slavery has disappeared. Slavery still exists on this earth. And in some places, it still exists in this country. It's not the kind of slavery we saw back in the South. It's worse. But there are young people, boys and girls who are being taken captive and kept as slaves 
until they can escape. Somebody helps them escape or they die. Many of them are moved out of this country and sold abroad. But some are forced into lives of degradation in this country. Don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I, I'm not aware of anybody that has directly experienced it here. But if you want to see it, go to Dallas early evening, just before sundown, drive along Industrial Boulevard or Harry Hines or uh, Greenville Avenue and you'll run into it. You'll see it happening because most of those people are slaves. Okay, we'll see you next week. Talk about what we're supposed to have talked about this week. Peace. I still have peace after all.